know an opportunity to have a genuinely uh, cross-disciplinary conversation about the social implications of technology. I've given lots and lots of talks in my life, but never one after, um, straight after a talk on cognitive computing, <laughs> I have to say. So it's never been more appropriate to use the old Monty Python joke. Here's for something entirely different than what you um, got this morning. But it's great to be in this context, and I really hope um, I'm going to leave time for uh, discussion at the end, because I really hope we can make some links between what seems um, a, a very uh, big divide. I'm going to talk a little bit about my um, new book and, I'm, and, and, and try and speak a bit more broadly as well about why I think science and technology and even what counts as skill, what counts as expertise, labour, how we think about time, uh, how these things I think are heavily influenced by gender relations. Um, Greg Adamson suggested the title, The Cyborg Manifesto 30 Years Later, as we've recently passed the 30th um, anniversary of, um, some of you know Haraway's very famous cyborg text, and it's an apt provocation for me because I'm often asked why feminism is still relevant now. People say to me, we've now entered a digital age, uh, the second machine age, I could quote all these authors' books that are very famous, the fourth industrial revolution, uh, you know, post-industrial society, there's lots of different expressions of this. But in all of this we think, well surely um, women's equality is old hat, why do we still have to bother uh, with this notion? And so I feel bound to just remind you that even Davos, you know, even Davos uh, World Report uh, this year said that it would take 118 years before women had equal pay with men. But they also said more uh, relevant uh, to this conference that actually the, the issue of the lack of women in computing and engineering is urgent, that all their predictions about where future job growth will be is in these sectors, there's a shortage in these sectors, and so a problem I've been working on for a good 30 years, which is the, the lack of women in STEM subjects, is more urgent than ever. But what I want to do today is really uh, talk a bit more broadly and to argue that gender actually shapes how we think about technology. And this is very important because I think it actually limits our capacity for thinking about alternative futures, for thinking about what alternative societies and futures might look like. And so I want to argue that the way we think about technology, work <coughs> and time are all bleakered by this imbalance um, in, in equal, um, equal opportunities for women and stereotypes for women. I mean, I've worked on this stuff for 30 years, as I said, and it, it, it was only two years ago that LEGO brings out its first female scientist um, figure, only two years ago. So let me just, um, so change takes longer than I ever thought, actually. Um, maybe even longer than the curve we had this morning about when we'll get to the height of um, cognitive computing. <coughs> Um, I'm a sociologist by background. I've been very involved in what's now broadly known as the field of the social studies of science and technology. And this field has for many years been challenging um, the notion that technologies are somehow neutral, value-free tools that emerge independently of society. Now, few academics today would subscribe to what's known as a hard technological determinism, this view that technology simply drive society. And I think there is now much more widespread recognition of the social, political and economic circumstances um, that establish, that are the context for establishing technologies. But I think what's still uh, less understood is the way that artefacts are socially shaped, not just in their usage, but in their very design and technical content. And when I say that all technologies are inherently social, what I mean is that I really think of technologies as crystallizations of society, that they always bear the imprint of the people and social context from which they emerge. And so in other words, what I've been arguing for a very long time is that technologies reflect and express our times as much as shape them. And for me, it's simply logical, and we can have, you know, we will have this discussion, I'm sure, it's simply logical for me that if you talk about social relations and politics as being imprinted in technology, that if we live in a society characterised by gender hierarchy, 
then surely these social relations will also be reflected in the kinds of technologies we choose to develop and invest in. And as I said, I think this matters hugely because it actually affects how we imagine our futures. And I'm struck again and again by when people talk about the futures, how much people bring in science fiction. You know, it's always science fiction comes in quite quickly um, in these discussions. And it's, it's as if we can't even think about the future without thinking about it in technological terms, in terms of futuristic technologies. And this brings me directly to the subject of robots. <clears throat> uh, I wrote some books years ago, many years ago now, on gender and technology. And looking back, which I did recently, it might seem that I was rather prescient in putting robot, uh, the robot Maria from Metropolis on the cover in 1991. Well, was I? I was thinking back to this time and thinking, I'm not sure that I was. I think what it shows is, is that this fixation on the agency of robots is age old. And I think what's interesting is why is it now in such ascendancy? I mean, if you think about it, as I'm sure you all know, as early as ancient Greece, we've been dreaming of robots. And the robots have basically taken two forms. The mindless mechanical slave that does everything for us on the one hand, and a more complex, more humanoid machine that possesses consciousness. And this dichotomy goes right back to Homer. And um, as we heard yesterday, it's part of current science um, fiction. Indeed, I think these ideas have remained remarkably similar. The science, um, some of these science fiction um, movies that we have today have these very ideas in them. And I'm reminded of the Greek myth of Pandora, the first human woman created by the gods, who had the gifts of speech and strength, but also in the end is very devious and opens uh, the jar from which evil comes. And in a lot of these current films, there's also the notion that somehow these female androids, in the end, will cunningly manipulate and outsmart the innocent male protagonist who fall in love with them. <laughs> and again, as we heard yesterday, in these scenarios, it's very difficult to think of these films with the sexes reversed, actually. They've got a particular gender politics to them, uh, that goes with them, um, and as we heard yesterday, if you substituted a male uh, voice for Scarlett Johansson, uh, it would be a it would be a sort of piss take, wouldn't it? It wouldn't actually kind of work at all as a film. So what I'm interested in is why, why, what does our contemporary fascination with humanoid machines tell us about our culture and the way it envisages the relationship between humans and machines? And so what I want to explore in the rest of the talk is the ways in which robotics and automation more generally embody our desire to save valuable time, to delegate labor, and thus free us for life's important things. The future on offer by the evangelist of Silicon Valley of a world replete with sociable robots is hyped as radical change. Robots promise to fulfill roles that are currently performed by people, to serve us in a service economy. And what I want to argue is that this vision of the future may turn out not to be as radical as they claim. And I think it's revealing, if not surprising, that these machines are often configured to resemble stereotypical human-like, often female bodies. But first, let me talk about the relationship between technology and time, the subject of my book. I already referred yesterday to the fact that I lived through the 1980s, the dawn of microelectronic revolution. I remember there were lots of theories about the post-industrial leisure society. Uh, we even talked about having to educate people for the leisure society that was about to emerge. And oddly enough, now we're in this digital age where the problem now is time poverty, mm -hmm. a shortage of time. The iconic image that abounds everywhere is of the harassed citizen, head down on a screen, always rushing. This is a recent uh, Economist uh, cover. Machines are supposed to make our lives easier, yet we hear constant laments that we're pressed for time, that the pace of life is accelerating. 
We've got more technology than we ever have before, and yet we're busier uh, than we ever were before. And we're also told that not only is the pace of life accelerating, but we're constantly told that the rate of technological innovation is itself accelerating, and that these, this is going to be a controversial issue here, I'm sure, but that these two things are causally linked, that, that, that we've got a speeding up of everyday life and a speeding up of technologies. And I think because this seems to be a, a, a popular thing, and of course there's the iconic self-driving car that really today seems to represent the dream of being able to sort of work while driving. This is the ultimate time-saving uh, promise. Now, acceleration isn't just a lifestyle trend. I think what's also interesting is that if you read, this is just for those of us who are social theorists here, if you read some contemporary social theory, it's all about uh, this society being characterised by um, acceleration. There's a lot of talk about digitalisation accelerating time and spawning a new temporality. And much is written about the supposed uh, fact that we're moving from linear clock time of the industrial age to this new instantaneous uh, temporality in which time is actually disappearing. There's lots of different um, social theorists, I'm not going to go into them here and I talk about them a lot in the book. Um, there's differences between them but what they share in common which I want to stress here is that they all share the idea that speed is the quintessential experience of modernity, that that's what we're living through. That if you have to characterise our current age, it's an age of speed, that the driving force for this age is technology, and often uh, it's seen as socially destructive. And, and you often get in these books a cautionary tale about the consequences of these things. And you see this even more, I think, in the popular, more popular literature, um, that comes out every week. I used to buy all of these books. I now can't even keep up with these books, but it is as if every week in the colour magazines, uh, in the bookshops, there's books coming out be bemoaning our state of busyness and distraction, uh, advising us on how to deal with digital addiction. And in all these books, what's blamed is hyperconnectivity, that this is what we're, we're suffering from. And the solution is, of is often a digital detox. You know, I'm at conferences where people say, I've gone off the grid for a whole three days. It was an amazing experience. <laughs> and of course, now we have a Californian company set up called Digital Detox. Of course, uh, we're going to have this where you can go for the weekend, uh, you go through a tech check where your phones are locked away, they're handed back at the end of the weekend, and their tagline, you know, um, which I just love, actually, is disconnect to reconnect. Fabulous. Um, and I can't help wondering how many people in California get back on Facebook on a Monday morning and boast about the fact that they spent a whole weekend without their gadgets. <laughs> now, the first thing to say about much of this writing is that I think it is still implicitly technologically determinist. People will say that they're not now, it's unfashionable to be a technological determinist, but in fact I think if you read the work, there's often this um, implicit assumption that we're hostages to these machines and that we need help because these machines are inevitably driving the fast pace of life. Now in my book as a sociologist, I argue, and I, you won't be surprised, that this contemporary imperative of speed is as much a cultural artefact as it is a technological one. Mm. That if we feel rushed and pressed for time, it's because of the priorities and parameters we set ourselves and not about the machines per se. And in other words, as an STS scholar, I conceive of technology and time as socio-material practices. We understand time with and through machines and we make sense of time with these machines, together with machines. And we're now constantly invited to work on our individual time with machines. Having a good relationship with time is now equated with having a good relationship with technology. If we can use the technologies properly, we'll have a good relationship with time. We'll have control, more control of our time. So does it matter then what sort of machines we have? I think it matters a great deal and what I want to do in the next part of the paper 
is actually think through a bit how our belief in the fact that it's that the faster we do things, the more we save time, how this belief is really fed by innovations, by the sort of innovations uh, we're getting. I haven't got time to go into a long history here, but in my book I describe how the sheer speed of innovation is now equated with inventiveness, productivity and efficiency. And I'd argue that it's the ultimate measure of progress and that this is very embedded in the heart of engineering, artificial intelligence and robotics. This idea that the latest, the fastest and the most automated systems are necessarily the best. Well, are they? Are the best technical designs always about maximising efficiency in the sense of being economical with time? I at least want to raise this issue, even though I know it's a controversial uh, thing to raise. Take something that you rarely think about searching the web. The speed of Google search engine is absolutely enthralling. But very few people sit back, although I'm sure some people here do, sit back and think, well, how are these search engines actually favouring some content over other content? There's a, a story that's a few years old now that some of you may be familiar with, which was that Google had to actually change their search engine because it was the case a few years ago that if you searched she invented, the autocorrect came up with the query, do you mean he invented? <laughs> a much more recent example, just from last month, and some of you may have read this, which was about searching for images, um, and that when you um, searched for three black teenagers, uh, what came up were actually mug shots, whereas if you put in three white teenagers, you've got these smiling faces, and there's been lots of discussion about this um, with Google, and, and lots of discussion about the fact, which you will all be aware of, that this isn't deliberate, a race bias or gender bias. It's actually about algorithms reflecting the values and cultures of the world we inhabit. Algorithms are always influenced uh, by those who design and write them, um, you know, there's a discussion now about to what extent uh, Google needs to take responsibility for its uh, search engines. But the point I want to make is that I think most people, most of the public, think of these search engines as somehow um, brokers of just knowledge, of neutral knowledge, that there aren't any values and culture in this knowledge, that they're just getting facts. And I actually uh, went to Google in London, because uh, we work with them a bit at the Oxford Internet Institute, where I'm also visiting professor. And I said to them, you know, why is the autocorrect function so important? You know, wouldn't it be better to have more accurate knowledge if you took more time? Uh, wouldn't that be a better thing? And the guy says to me, you just don't get it about latency, do you? You just don't get it. I mean, my friends who work on high frequency trading just laughed and said yes. Latency is the most important thing. But he said to me, if you slow down uh, the search engine, um, even by half a second, you would lose 20% in traffic. So as far as they're concerned, speed is the main thing. And um, <clears throat> you know, my dream, which might be that there are a range of search engines and that they might represent different forms of knowledge and might be more subtle, um, isn't, go isn't going to occur very quickly. Now, I want to say immediately that I'm not um, at all uh, pessimistic about technology. I'm not anti-technology. Of course, I use search engines. I love vacuum cleaners and all of my domestic technologies. Um, I think all these things are very wonderful. But I wonder about the limits of what we want to use technology for. And I'm particularly concerned about the quest for a humanoid intelligent machine that will not only serve us, but create the illusion that it understands us, cares for us. And I want to sort of talk a bit about um, not only the problems of the possibility of this, which I think is a real issue, but also whether we think it's desirable, whether we should sort of think a little bit about where we're going with effective uh, computing, uh, with emotional intelligence, with all of these things, whether we really think uh, these developments should be embraced uncritically. Now, as you all know, lots of these robots are being designed 
to give the uh, impression that they have feelings. Here we have a nurse bot, uh, Pearl, who's given facial expressions so that it can take an anthropomorphic form. And there's, I was at a, um, just in London last week, we had the guy uh, from Japan who's made the, um, those seals, those pet seals, you know, the white furry seals um, that for um, aged people was um, telling us about how wonderful they were. And I think what's particularly interesting with these kinds of designs is why scientists persist in designing robots that take a bodily form, whether it's a cuddly um, animal like a seal, uh, a child, there's, they're often childs, often um, like boys, or adult uh, females. And this is despite the fact that I'm told actually that this isn't the most functional way to design a robot, but actually there are a lot of engineering problems with doing it in this way. And I think it might seem innocent enough to be uh, pursuing uh, humanoid robots, but it seems to me that actually part of the legitimation of this whole scientific enterprise is to make these robots human-like, that making them human-like, that giving robot creatures names, and I'm very interested in how they, or then there are names, Asimo or Pepper or you know, even Watson, if I dare may say so, that all these names <coughs> serve to give these machines somehow um, some individuality, some personality, to make them more, <coughs> excuse me, to make them appear much more sort of personal to us, much more able to be, um, for us to project feelings onto them. And I'm sure you've read all these studies, and Sherry Turkle, for example, has done wonderful studies about how much people do, how, how easy we find it to get attached to these machines. And this is not only kids, I'm told, but she says that even scientists um, in the evening can feel uh, bad about leaving these robotic creatures uh, in the lab overnight because mm. they'll feel lonely, they'll be cold, you know. <laughs> and, I mean, I can't explain uh, why humans have this extraordinary capacity, and it is a really extraordinary capacity, to respond to these machines. But I think what's important to recognise is how much these projects rely on this promise, that they wouldn't work without this. And what I'm particularly concerned about is the use of the possible use of robotics um, employed in caring roles for entertaining children and nursing the elderly. And of course, uh, we already have uh, Pepper here being sold, I'm told, or, uh, very well uh, in Japan already. And the chief executive, uh, Mayoshu Son, talks about the fact that uh, Pepper can educate, entertain, help with banking and hotel check-ins. Uh, he says that Pep at Pepper's launch, he said that this was a baby step in our dream to make a robot that can understand a person's feelings and then autonomously take action. We are putting emotion into the robot and giving it a heart, he said. The Japanese promotional material portrays the substitution of robots for babysitting, housework, and elder care as freeing up time to restore sociability. I have to say I found this rather ironic in that I read all the time that Japanese kids are spending all their time on screens so I thought to myself, well, what, what's the time being freed up for? You know, more time to stare at screens. Like, there's not a lot of discussion about what we're going to do with this time. But seriously, what would it mean in practice, really, to have domestic nurse bots to look after the elderly? Of course, they potentially can do wonderful things in terms of taking people this kind of fluid, open-ending caring one that goes beyond serving three meals a day, doesn't fit with the rigid clock time of machines. I mean, if you think about caring tasks, they're often fragmented and woven into a whole lot of other tasks. They're not discrete tasks. And giving and receiving care actually involves slowness, often just being there, often just sitting in presence. 